people walking in maybe a little late, but we have a lot to cover in only an hour and a half of your lunch break. <laughs> so first of all, I want to welcome you to the public event, The Other Side of Gender, Masculinity Issues in Violent Conflict. My name is Kathleen Keenest. As the lead of the Institute's new Gender and Peace Building Initiative, I want to welcome all of you. Uh, we have people represented from policy world, academic world, NGO, and many others, and we appreciate you coming to the event. For those who may be new uh, to the Institute, the United States Institute of Peace is an independent, nonpartisan, national institution established and funded by Congress to help prevent and resolve violent international conflicts promote post-conflict stability and development and increase conflict management capacity tools and intellectual capital worldwide. Putting together the event today was in part inspired by a book called The Other Side of Gender. I first read it three years ago when I was at the World Bank and it really did offer a shift in the gender paradigm for me. It uh, basically challenges the premise of the discourse on gender over the last 30 years in which the term gender has often been used synonymously with that of women. I think it is timely today amid significant strides forward in the recognition of women not only as victims of war but also important actors in peace building that we also consider the need to expand our analytical lens of gender to include issues of masculinity, especially in the context of conflict. As more and more information is reaching the general public about extreme sexual violence taking place in the DRC, Sierra Leone, and most recently, Guinea, it is evident that we need to engage in analysis that looks at both male and female actors as victims and perpetrators to better inform our policies and our practitioner work. The panelists here today suggest that a better understanding of the social roles and social constraints on men and boys in society, and especially in conflict settings, can contribute to women, security, and peace building. They base their analysis on their own field work in conflicts in Africa and South America. Let me turn now to our panelists and a few housekeeping details. We are oversubscribed to this event, so if you have uh, phones, I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't mind turning them off because we are webcast, and phones on webcast sound peculiar, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, in terms of being webcast, uh, it will be important for our panelists as well as for any uh, of you who would like to make comments or ask questions uh, in our discussion period to speak directly into the microphone uh, so our remote audience can clearly hear your remarks. Each of our panelists will speak for about 10 minutes and then we will open it up uh, for discussion I will ask uh, the three panelists uh, to give us their kind of wrap-up remarks about 1.20, and we will close at 1.30 today. In order of appearance, I want to briefly highlight the bios of each of the panelists. Pia Peters is a senior social development specialist in the Africa region in the Conflict and Social Development Unit at the World Bank. The work she is involved in directly supports gender and conflict efforts in sub-Saharan Africa, but her work extends back 15 years looking at issues in Sierra Leone, post-conflict Burundi, Rwanda, and also in Latin America and the Caribbean region. Mark Summers, our second panelist, is currently a Jennings Randolph Senior Fellow here at the Institute of Peace. He's also an associate research Professor of Humanitarian Studies in the Institute of Human Security at the Fletcher School, Tufts University. His work uh, has focused on Western popular cultural icons and youth as important contributors to warfare as well as to peace building. And the many countries and work he's been involved in include Burundi, Kosovo, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Southern Sudan. And finally, Maria Correa is 
Program Manager of Fragile States at the Conflict and Social Development Unit of the African Region of the World Bank. It's a very long title. <laughs> <laughs> Maria is also the co-editor of the book, The Other Side of Gender. She has uh, great experience as well in uh, Latin America, Caribbean, and African regions. And she will bring uh, also an institutional framework in which to look at this other side of gender. And without any further delay, I would like to ask our first panelist, Pia Peters, to uh, take the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for the very nice introduction. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the male side of gender-based violence in post-conflict countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And in this context, when we talk about gender-based violence or sexual gender-based violence, it's in the context of a weapon of war. When we think about the male side in this context, we see different roles for, that men have. First of all, as perpetrators. Second of all, as witnesses of crimes. Third of all, as family members of survivors of sexual gender-based violence. Fourth, as victims. And five, and not at least, as agents of change going to run very quickly through these five different roles in this context. Um, first of all, as perpetrators, we believe that there is a need to understand much better where, especially for example, currently in Eastern DRC, the very high level of sexual gender-based violence and especially the intensity of the violence that goes together, which is crimes. Where is this actually coming from? Why are the levels so high? We know sexual and gender-based violence as a weapon of war is not new. It has been, I believe, there since humanity existed and started having wars. But what we currently see happening in Eastern DRC seems, unfortunately, to take this to a new level. Um, we all know from the news articles and reporting on this issue, this is by uh, several armed groups. It's both irregular armed groups, but it's also by regular armed groups in the countries. Um, another example is, for example, Uganda, where we have the LRA, uh, the Lord Resistance Army. Uh, when they use sexual and gender-based violence in that context, it's very organized and they really use it in a very systematic way. A second role is men as witnesses. Um, often fathers, husbands, brothers, other male family members are forced to watch when uh, women in the family are raped. This is really partly with an intention to break down the social fabric, which often leads, of course, to tremendous trauma. However, to this group of people in current programming that, are, that is out there, there is very, if no, attention at all. There is no trauma counseling or other services available in the vast majority of cases which can lead us to question of, could this potentially lead to future violence? We know from what we know of domestic violence that often this is a vicious circle. People who have suffered this as kids might have a high propensity of being perpetrators in the future. A third role is as family members of survivors. It's very often um, difficult in the local context when a survivor of sexual and gender-based violence tries to go back home to her family and to her community. Uh, there is tremendous stigma around this and there is very often rejection, uh, even more so when there are children who are born out of rape, this increases this. Um, this goes together partly also with the issue of masculinity, with the, one of the primary role of the man as a protector of his family, which in these cases he feels he has obviously failed. A fourth one is as a victim. Uh, we know from reports in DRC that this is currently on the race. This carries with it tremendous social trauma, trauma and is often seen as kind of the ultimate humiliation of what can be done to a man. So needless to say, they're even much less forthcoming to look for services than female victims. And in addition, there are very few services who kind of tailor to this group 
the services that are available often want to help this group, but also often don't know how to do this because you need a different approach, of course, and you need different skills of service providers to tailor to this group. Um, fifth of all, as agents of change. This is very key uh, when we think about prevention. Uh, several groups that uh, should be taught about are military, the police, community leaders, but also, for example, youth. Um, in these type of com context uh, that we talk about, there's often kind of a breakdown of traditional community structure and traditional values. So on the other hand, this kind of opens up an opportunity to challenge and change traditional gender roles. Among others, especially uh, related to the police and military, UNDP and UNFPA have been doing uh, quite a bit of work on, on this subject. So where in general do we stand on these issues? Addressing male issues on sexual and gender-based violence in post-conflict countries in sub-Saharan Africa is, it is very new. It's a new area and we are all together, researchers and practitioners, trying to understand better and how we can address this. There is increasingly research around this topic. Um, the knowledge that we have so far comes much more from the field of domestic violence and also from the field of health services. How do we involve men, be it HIV, AIDS, reproductive health, etc. An organization that has been very active in this is uh, Men Engage. But we have much uh, less knowledge about how does this work actually in conflict areas. A couple of people are looking into this, among others, the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, who tried to understand in DRC where, what are the different groups of perpetrators, where is this coming from? What are some challenges at the operational level? We start to see more and more research. We do not know yet how to address this at the operational level. We don't know yet what is working. There are very few initiatives when I started thinking about this and started um, looking together uh, with my colleagues, like what has been out there? Who's currently working on this in practice on the ground? We could find almost no examples. Um, one that I want to name is Women for Women who have a men's leadership program in Eastern DRC, which was like one of the only programs that we could find who tried to address this. So when we want to try to address this, first of all, I think together with practitioners, we have to learn what work. We kind of have to learn by doing together. Um, second of all, we have to keep in mind we work in extremely challenging environments where there are very, very many demands and limited resources available. So we kind of sometimes have competing for resources. One issue that is also a challenge is uh, this topic can be very controversial and is sometimes also used in a negative way that is definitely not meant to be when we bring this to the uh, table. When I was uh, in the DRC during my last mission, a couple of people in government have picked up on, yes, we have to look at male issues of sexual and gender-based violence, but they use it now more when they talk about this as, you know, why are you focusing on the woman? And yes, we poor men are also victims. Now, the people who say this are not victims themselves. They more try to use this as an excuse of why there's such high levels of violence. So we have to be very careful. Um, and I will uh, make it short. One other issue that I want to highlight linked to the controversy around this, when we involve men in this issue, this is to the benefit of both the men themselves, but also the women. Both groups will benefit about this. Just very quickly, a couple of issues or things we are currently doing on this issue at the World Bank. As for many other partners, this is very new to us. Uh, we are currently working together with the International Rescue Committee in Eastern DRC on a gender-based violence program. Um, it's a very small program. Uh, the majority is funded by our colleagues from USAID. Linked to that program, we started to do also research to talk to perpetrators and to understand where this is coming from. In some times it's very organized, in other times not. And needless to say, for those of you who are familiar with Eastern DRC, there are many, many diverse groups, and so they're organized very, very different. Another issue we're looking into is trauma counseling, and does it have an impact if you actually provide trauma counseling to men who either have witnessed this or also family members? And in a couple of countries, we want to look at 
some small initiatives of ongoing programs who work around this issue and would like to include men in these different roles in their operational programming that we kind of help them to develop tools and learn about this together. And I hope I didn't go too much over my time, Kathleen. Thank you. Thanks, Pia. Mark Summers, can you take Thanks, Kathleen. Um, I just made a uh, note, a couple of notes some, from uh, just to uh, support some things that um, Pia just said. Um, uh, one of them is uh, this issue of that she talks about that uh, in Eastern DRC is the sexual uh, violence is, is too, is gone to another level. I think that there, I think it's pretty clear in modern history at the very least We've never seen anything like this, and that um, something I wrote about about this issue is that it's 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 actually sexual terrorism. It's the main way that war is practiced in Eastern Congo, and it is a, a thorough emergency. This is a place that the, the casualties are now, according to IRC, over 5.4 million people in this war, and a lot of them, it seems to me, have run away from this rape and fle have fled into the forests and starved to death. Um, uh, so I just wanted to put that. And the other thing is, is that I think <clears throat> masculinity and conflict seems to put these two ideas, I think uh, uh, um, it's a little bit more serious than that. And I just made a note to myself when Pia was talking that actually I think the, uh, the, 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 the real, the primary issue is emasculation or the threat of emasculation and what are um, the threats of that? What are the the uh, results of that. So I wanted to start uh, this with a very brief story about, because it involves uh, Pia and Maria. Um, Peter Yuvin and I were asked um, by Maria at first, and then Pia joined in, uh, to do this research on youth in, in Central Africa. Um, and you know we put together this methodology, which I'll talk a little bit about in a, in a moment, uh, to, uh, to, we wanted to do the same methodology in both countries with the same sample of youth. Uh, Peter in, in Burundi and myself with uh, youth in Rwanda. Um, and so we, we, you know, we put together the methods and we sent it to P and Maria. And Maria said, look, you know, I don't see here masculinity. You know, where are you going to have masculinity? I mean, is it going to come out? And so when I went out in the field with my team, the first week, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, boy, we better find masculinity because, you know, I got to <laughs> tell something to Maria. <laughs> And so um, I start, question number three is, um, what's the situation of youth? And youth, this is in rural uh, Rwanda, and, and immediately people start talking about roofing, roof tiles. And I'm thinking, what? Okay, so, um, they, and then even female youth, they're saying, well, you know, the situation here on, about roof tiles is very serious. And I'm thinking, what, what, what are you talking about? So the second um, week, I, uh, you know, there's four of us doing interviews, I decided to go to roofing class and start to find out from people, what's this deal about roofing? So then after this, I emailed Maria, after I came back from the field the second week, to email her and, and just said, really, there's nothing to worry about. Um, the, the main issue, the main finding uh, from the research with youth in Rwanda um, was masculinity or, um, and the inability, the, the, the real difficulty that male youth uh, or we're having in, in um, becoming men and the cascading problems that, um, uh, that arose because of this and directly impacted the lives of female youth and in fact the whole society. So um, the main recommendation, which I'll get back to in a few minutes, that I'll be sharing is this, that in many contexts, including Rwanda, in order to help female youth effectively, you must help, help male youth first. Now this is a clear finding, or uh, this, this derives directly from the research that took place with youth in Rwanda. Um, so I want to just mention a little bit about the research methods again. Um, Peter Yuvin's book on Rwandan, uh, Burundian youth is out. Um, it's called Life After Violence, A People's Story of Burundi. And the, uh, the book on um, a Rwandan youth uh, is um, just about done. And it's, um, it's called 200 Francs, Masculinity, Urbanization, and the World of Rwandan Youth. Um, what we did in this uh, research was to, um, uh, it, it, sort of the overall approach was to find out from youth 
what were their priorities, perspectives, and concerns? And then to craft policy recommendations based on those. Now, I have to just say, not just in Rwanda, but most definitely including Rwanda, this is a radical approach. You do not ask un undereducated young people about anything. You tell them what to do. As, they, as many elites would say and in the government, you know, you have, to give, you have to bring them development. You have to tell them what to do. They don't have education. You know, the implication is they're not very bright and they're stubborn and they're resisting uh, uh, becoming developed. So this was a really a radical idea and I want to point out that uh, officials in the government were very supportive of it. Um, uh, so uh, what did we find? Actually, there's a, <laughs> there's a phrase what elites use in both countries is, you know, when they get information, there's a, uh, uh, a saying that, you know, we inform the population, which is basically educated people take it, telling the, the massive uneducated majority of what they need to know about. Um, so we had open-ended qualitative questions in both countries, and we used the same 20 questions and then added and subtracted as we moved along in both countries, and we did a sampling procedure. So we were basically asking the same questions to the same sample of youth in Rwanda and Burundi. What was so striking was how dramatically different the situations of youth were and how, in, in, at the outset, counterintuitive uh, these findings were. So what did we find? Well, before I, I get to what we found on, for one particularly interesting question, a little background on the two countries, very brief. Um, Rwanda right now, is, ha is the, its renown right now is for economic growth and governance. And it has a very high kind of sparkling reputation as a model of development. I should like to point out that it also had a reputation as a model of development before the genocide. Um, and uh, it's also, it's pretty darn stable. Okay, let's look at Burundi. Right now, before the elections, it's pretty touch and go down there. Uh, so the idea of, actually with a lot of Rwandan government officials, the idea that this was a regional uh, study involving these two countries didn't go over very well. You know, that to compare Rwanda to Burundi right now was not something that, um, that was particularly appealing because the impression is, is that that's early post-war, really struggling to get onto its feet, whereas Rwanda, you know, has these ambitions, I don't know if you know this, to become a middle-income country in about 20 years or maybe, maybe 10. I can't remember. Uh, Vision 2020 has a blueprint for how they're going to get there, and that's really their objective. Um, so we might assume, therefore, that Rwandan youth, not Burundian youth, would prioritize education to prepare to participate in Rwanda's new knowledge-based economy. It's going to have IT uh, be the hub for the, for the region and so forth. We found the opposite to be true. So what was the question? The question six in our questionnaires for youth in both countries was the following. Do you have a plan for improving your situation? Asking youth in rural and urban youth in both countries. Virtually every Burundian youth highlighted education in their plans. You know, it's like, what's your plan? Okay, first, I'm going to secondary school. Or not, my plan is, this is male and female youth, uh, a vocational school. Now, if you think about this, you look around, there aren't any secondary schools. There aren't any <laughs> vocational schools, or there's, it's very hard to get in. But that's their plan. Education, and then they're going to be entrepreneurs. OK. Meanwhile, in Rwanda, where they are, they're in the process of doubling the access to secondary education, where they have a plan for really expanding access to vocational education, almost no Rwandan youth even mentioned education in their plans. Almost never. It was, it was startling. To the extent that I had to add, add some questions on education to find out uh, what was going on. Well, it turns out that most Rwandan youth wouldn't go to a secondary school if it was right next to their house. Education, we learned, is, it's not that it's not valued. It's just it, it cannot be the priority because of the pressures on youth to become adults. Um, the predominant priority is to achieve adulthood. Male youth must build a house and get married before becoming men. Um, and, um, and they reported that there was a very strong chance that this would never occur. But as many of them said, we have no choice but to try. We heard many times, we have no choice, or I have no choice. In short, uh, many male youth leave primary school 
or wait till they complete primary school to start working to save money for a house, which they may never complete. What about female youth? If there's no men, if there's no male youth ready to, to, to marry, then they, there is no way that they be, can become women, socially recognized as women. It's impossible. And the reason is, is quite simple, that um, it's dependent, womanhood is dependent on manhood, not just in Rwanda, but in many, many uh, societies across the globe. Um, so what's going on here? Here's a quote from an executive secretary, because, you know, I'm asking these questions, and, you know, this is pretty, like, basic Rwandan 101 for people living there. So an executive secretary of a rural sector, he's a very powerful man uh, in this area, um, summed it up as follows. He said, look, you can't become a man without building a house. To be a woman, you have to marry. If a woman produces children without a, hu a husband, then she's a prostitute. Uh, and if she reaches 28, year old, 28 years old without getting married, then she will be rejected by youth society. She will become an old lady and not a woman. Now, the issue of waiting until you're 28 and talking to men, and particularly youth in the area, is like 28? Nobody's going to marry a 28-year-old woman. After 24 or 25, that's it. Um, now, the window of opportunity for a female youth is 21 to about 20, maybe let's say 25. You got four years to get married. And this is in a country where, according to statistics after the genocide, for every 100 women, there's 88 men. So 12% are going to be old ladies and never be married because there's nobody to marry, and polygamy is vig vigorously uh, put down. So um, what we found is that Rwandan youth are extraordinarily risk averse and are driven by severe adulthood pressures. While it, whereas um, in Burundi, they're very optimistic and have a strong sense of becoming independent entrepreneurs. The, the threat of failure, of being a failed uh, uh, youth, of it, unable to become a male adult, it wasn't a big deal there. Um, uh, it's a different kind of uh, society, a different kind of government, a different kind of culture. Um, so the final thoughts uh, is, um, you know, uh, the research tells us that a key post-war policy question is the following. Are youth able to become adults, and what happens if they can't become adults? Education may or, not, may or, uh, may or may not play a role. Um, so if you go, go back to this recommendation that I gave at the beginning, that in many contexts, in order to help female youth effectively, you must help male youth first. Um, where you have a situation where attaining womanhood is dependent on male youth, uh, a first uh, a, a attaining manhood, then helping male youth build a house and being able to marry is going to help female youth as well. Um, so what, what this indicates um, is that in countries like Burundi and East Timor, where it's easier to attain ad uh, uh, adulthood, um, the sectoral approach that people have you know, most donors have in agencies on education, on health, on and things like that, uh, might work. Um, but in places like Rwanda, and believe me, there's a lot of countries like Rwanda, uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone um, come to mind, um, where th the issues, the values of education and employment might be very high. However, for a lot of youth, male youth, in order to become a, a, a man, it's access to land that matters more, and housing, 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 housing was the main uh, recommendation for Rwanda. No question about it. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, first of all, for organizing this event, and, and thank you for the invitation. I'm going to speak a little bit about um, the institutional environment of um, incorporating men and masculinity issues in, um, in the gender agenda, and specifically what has happened in the World Bank since we published this book, The Other Half of Gender, back in 2006 in terms of policy and programming. On the policy side, uh, the current policy on gender at the World Bank dates back to 2003. And it is broad and inclusive of both men and gender, so it, it moved beyond uh, the previous um, successor, po the previous policy which focused on, on women, and it refers only to gender. And when you look at the best practice note, it refers always to men and women, girls, boys, m uh, 
female and male issues. So while it doesn't um, address men and masculinity issues uh, per se, it also doesn't address female issues per se, and it also doesn't address conflict. It's, it's rather a neutral policy and, and uh, allows for, for some interpretation, but it isn't inclusive, as I said, in terms of both men and women. Uh, in terms of, of practice, um, uh, the, the gender community in the bank um, has not focused at all on, on male gender issues uh, since probably less so even uh, since the publication of the book, although I don't think that's a coincidence. That it isn't a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, in fact, there has been a move to a more a uh, narrow uh, approach um, to, to, to gender and a focus on, on women's economic empowerment. This is just, this is more reflects the strategic choice of the current leaders um, in, in the bank um, as opposed to um, a policy change in and of itself. And it re reflects, I think, um, a view that this is the bank's comparative advantage and uh, this, and women's economic empowerment is the, the priority. There is actually an ongoing evaluation by the bank now of, of the bank's uh, uh, gender policy, and uh, there has been some criticism of this of this narrow focus. Although there ha the criticism doesn't include the fact that it's uh, the policy is uh, the work has not addressed male gender issues. Outside the gender um, community, however, uh, the, the situation is is somewhat more positive. Um, Pia spoke about the work that we have done in the Africa region uh, within the context of social development, fragility, and, um, and post-conflict. Uh, this work started some time ago, as, as, um, as Mark uh, uh, referred to uh, what we started back on Burundi and Rwanda some, some time ago. Um, however, um, it, it became more prominent uh, during the, the time of the multi-country demobilization and reintegration program in the Great Lakes region when we developed a specific gender program to look at, um, at that perspective within the context of demobilizing um, ex-combatants. And, and that has now led to a larger program, a multi-million dollar program on gender and conflict that has a specific theme of masculinity. So this is, this is quite an important advance uh, in the Africa region. Outside the Africa region, um, in particular in the Latin America and the Caribbean, um, where urban youth violence is a concern, uh, this is uh, men and masculinity has also come up, and it is uh, being dealt with in the context of urban development programs. More broadly in the bank, um, the energy and drive on, uh, or some energy, I'll say, perhaps not the drive, uh, has, uh, on male and masculinity has come within um, the social development department and um, a specific uh, unit that has been set up on conflict, uh, violence, and, and youth. So they are looking at uh, men and uh, masculinity in the context of that work, which is mostly analytical, but, but also um, some support on, on operations as, as well. Um, now, in, in, in thinking about um, our client countries and where the demand has come from, if there is a demand at all, it is not coming, again, uh, from the gender community, but we have seen some interest from our, our country clients, uh, particularly those that are in a post-conflict phase and that are dealing with um, young, idle men, and uh, where there are concerns that this could, um, that th there's potentially a pool of, of future young fighters and a risk of future future conflict. Uh, when um, our Congolese officials from the Republic of Congo came to us looking um, to design a, a demobilization reintegration program, one of the specific issues that they asked us to address was idle youth. And this came up in, um, has come up in Central African Republic more recently. Uh, Pia was commenting to me uh, in Uganda there are concerns about um, unemployed youth. And also in West Africa, Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia. So there is some demand for this issue, not specifically on men and masculinity, but certainly looking at the issues faced by, by young men. So in, in thinking back and looking uh, uh, at the bank, um, I went back to, to the book, which I hadn't opened up in some years, but in the last couple of, of paragraphs, we predicted that um, the, the um, initiative on men and, and, and uh, masculinity would not come from the gender community. It would come from, from these other groups, such as um, the, the security sector, conflict, and social development um, 
uh, areas, and this has indeed turned out uh, to be the case in, in the World Bank. Now, um, why is this? Uh, why hasn't uh, this been, been embraced by the, the, the gender community? I'm not speaking specifically uh, now about the World Bank, but generally what we have observed among um, aid agencies and the bank and other organizations, there still seems to be um, a view that uh, women's gender issues are more important and uh, that, um, that women have, have faced the greatest disadvantages and therefore their needs need to be first before um, addressing the needs of uh, looking at, at male gender issues. Those are secondary even though the evidence shows that um, uh, ultimately men must be brought into this, um, into, to, into the work because gender of course is relational. And uh, also this, this view assumes a zero sum game. So um, in fact my view is, <laughs> is uh, that if you look at, if you have a, a broader perspective on gender it actually brings in um, groups that otherwise would not be interested in, in these issues. I think there's still a fear um, that bringing in men is sort of letting in the enemy. And uh, there's still a lot of mistrust and, and fear that, that men will then control, men will dominate the agenda. There is, this is um, uh, uh, understandable, but this is something that we, um, we have to face as well. At, at the level of, of top management, we have to face the fact that gender is not a, a top issue. I mean, people's jobs do not depend, or on, depend on whether <laughs> they will address um, gender issues or not. So um, smaller symbolic uh, activities um, focused on women uh, tend to be easier th and less messy than dealing with these broader, broader societal um, uh, gender issues. Um, another, another point which I think is important to, to mention is that we don't have a, a strong and visible constituency on male gender issues, internal or external. Um, uh, I mean, it's basically non-existent when it comes to men and it's, it's unlikely to happen. Um, if you think, for example, um, of, a, of a head of a government lobbying for women's issues, a female head of government lobbying for uh, women's issues, this would be seen quite normal, but it would be unthinkable, unimaginable that a male head of state would <laughs> be lobbying for male gender issues. It's, it's just, it's not going to happen. So that, that then leads to, to less, lesser demand and, and uh, less, a need to, less need to respond um, to these kinds um, of issues. I should say that uh, it, it's not true that uh, there hasn't been advances, uh, not inside the bank, but outside the bank and other organizations taking on male gender issues. I know my colleagues, for example, in UNIFEM, um, have, there is a, a, a dedicated unit to on men. But interestingly, um, it tends to be marginalized within the, the gender, with, within <laughs> UNIFEM, in, in, in much the same way that UNIFEM tends to be marginalized within the, um, the UN agency family. So it's, it's an interesting um, uh, observation. Um, what do we learn in terms of the in terms of the future? Um, I, I think that um, it's still going to be difficult to bring in, um, you know, the, the die-hard uh, gender community that have been, you know, fighting long and hard for for um, for women's rights. The the evolution of within the World Bank and aid agencies has meant that that there that there um, there is an inclination um, towards women's issues. And there will be a resistance um, still to address these these male issues. Uh, I think that the change and the the energy will come from the mid level bureaucrats uh, who are working on issues such as conflict and uh, violence and uh, HIV AIDS and et cetera that that see that there is really a male perspective in in these issues. And I, I think that it will be sort of a more organic. Um, uh, growth of this, of this, uh, uh, or, or interest taken in this issue, and, and less, less ideological. On a practical side, I just wanted to reiterate what Pia said earlier that um, while there is a recognition, and hopefully growing recognition, of the importance of the issue um, of male gender <laughs> issues, there is still very much a need now to to actually learn about what we can do in practice, um, and that is that is is something that. Um, the Africa region is going to be working on in the, in the near future a, a practitioner's um, uh, guideline based on the experiences that are, that are emerging now. So I'll end here. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Maria. <coughs>
As uh, some of you may have questions or comments and want to organize yourself, um, I'm going to take the lead here in uh, beginning with the questions. I, I would be interested in all of you responding. Um, it seems to me that we do talk a great deal about institutions and primarily from perhaps an aid perspective when, it, when we look at uh, women's issues and in this context, uh, context the issue of masculinities. But I, I would really appreciate if you could comment on these agents of change. I think Pia outlined, outlined five different ways to look at the masculinity issue. And in particular, religious leaders. Uh, one of the things in Africa, for sure, and we see it now in Uganda around uh, issues of homosexuality and a fairly uh, extreme case of calling for the death penalty. Can you speak to it from, uh, you, you came at this particular topic in, in uh, perfectly different ways, but I'd like to see where the religious leadership uh, comes into this in terms of agents of change for the better, for the worse, and uh, what part of the story uh, might need to be uh, grappled with here. Thank you, and then uh, if you could let me know by a show of hand, Ryan will uh, help in getting the, okay, very good, one, two, three, I have these three right now. All right, if you can begin and we'll organize the. Uh, okay, do we need a first or? Oh, sorry. The religious sorry. leaders. <coughs> um, Yes, uh, how can we bring in religious leaders? And Kathleen, as you rightly pointed out, there's currently a very hot debate in Uganda uh, around homosexuality going to asking for the death penalty. I think I read yesterday or the day before yesterday an article about this that currently the president has less common sense. So I wouldn't always say in general bring in the religious leaders, but I know, for example, in, in DRC, in Eastern DRC, they try to bring them in because they often in the community are seen as leaders in the community. So if you can work with, with these type of leaders and through them help change attitudes, you can reach a lot. These people can ha often have uh, a very strong voice in the communities. So I think if you're able to bring them in, you can have a very big impact. Of course, sometimes this goes to extremism and uh, they might preach certain views that we definitely would not support. I just wanna give a small example. This is by now four to five years ago in Sierra Leone on how this can be done. I taught in an innovative way. I went to church in Sierra Leone in Freetown. Um, it was a Protestant church. And the priest talked about HIV AIDS and how you have to protect yourself and how you have to use a condom and had a wooden um, penis and used how to use a condom. Now that probably had a much bigger impact than many of, on, of the other efforts currently going on in the city. So I think there can be very good size of it and we also have to be very cautious sometimes. Maybe? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll just uh, reflect a little bit on um, experience that in, uh, from Argentina when I worked in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, there was a, a, a study that the World Bank conducted on social capital and it, it um, revealed that in fact um, the, the church as an institution was uh, not perhaps not surprisingly, but I think that it was even surprising to the, to the researchers how, um, how much uh, the society was depending on on churches for a whole range of um, uh, of support, and um, it was uh, so. I in, in that case, uh, obviously, one cannot um, uh, ignore the the influence of, of the church as an institution, and um, as as Pia said, they can be extremely influential if you can bring them on board. So it's a question of how you approach um, um, gender issues. In the, in the case of, of Argentina, we, um, th we actually uh, um, had a project that was in, uh, funded by the World Bank that focused on, on gender from a family perspective, and that was a very um, effective approach, obviously not looking at the family from 
uh, a conventional perspective, but looking at how gender roles were, were influencing different family members from different perspectives. And from there, we could, we could introduce uh, male gender issues. Thank you. Um, I'm going to comment on uh, Africa uh, and religion because it's something, that's, and particularly Christianity, because it's something that I've, I've done research on. And I um, just three quick points. If you go into a poor, and this would actually apply to the first point, would definitely apply to uh, Muslims as well as Christians uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. If you go into a city, a uh, poor area, um, and, and, in, and generally the rule of thumb that uh, is, you know, well, not, it's not a rule of thumb. We know that cities um, expand dramatically during and after wars. Um, nobody know, has any idea how big Kinshasa is. Juba went from 70,000 people during the war, when it was a garrison town, to uh, the estimates are over a million people uh, in, in Juba, in southern Sudan. Um, Freetown it doubled, it, it at least tripled. So did Pristina, by the way, in, in, in Kosovo. Uh, after, at the, in, uh, after the war. What does this tell us when you go into these poor neighborhoods, uh, as I have many times, basically the only people working with poor youth are religious groups. There isn't anybody else. And they do have, uh, there's, a, there's an idea that youth programming must be holistic. You better believe it's holistic. I mean, a Pentecostal church, they have assignments for you to do every single day if you're a Pentecostal youth. There isn't anybody else <laughs> in these areas that are targeting or in fact viewing youth uh, in a positive way uh, in these extraordinarily poor and uh, fluid areas. Um, and these churches and mosques, I mean, they pop up very quickly. As soon as there's a, a new peri-urban neighborhood, there's a mosque, there's a church uh, that's being, it's going up. Um, a couple of other uh, points though, I mean, and I'm talking now traditionally in terms of uh, a culture generally is that it's very conservative. So. Uh, traditionally, you know, the idea of homosexuality is just, is just an impossibility. It cannot be admitted. It cannot be realized. It's very common for church leaders to say, we do not have homosexuality here. And there is a strong belief uh, that if you do it, you're going to, you're, it's, it's immediate damnation and you're going to be thrown out of society. Um, that's quite common uh, as, a, as, a, as a perspective. And the, another part of this traditional uh, uh, approach is that, is that female youth and, and, uh, and women, but particularly female youth, have extraordinarily subordinate roles um, in society. And I, I would say from my research uh, with, um, uh, in war and post-war societies in the past 20 years, easily the most disadvantaged and at-risk population uh, to generalize is female youth. And uh, there is a... A fee, uh, for urban uh, female youth in particular, there, I don't know if there's a population in these post-war countries that is more invisible than these people. Um, and their situations are extraordinarily desperate. And there is, uh, in Kigali right now, there is a female youth emergency in, those, in Kigali uh, for the poor female youth, no question about it. Thank you, Mark. We're going to begin our questions from uh, the audience discussion. If you could uh, identify yourself sure. and organization affiliation. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Tina Tinda. I'm a diversity advisor in human resources at the Inter-American Development Bank. I just started in May last year. Before that, I was gender advisor at the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, and I served in uh, peacekeeping operations in um, the former Yugoslavia and Cambodia, uh, among other things. Um, I want to thank you all for the wisdom that you're sharing. Um, and um, I think in this room there are many others who have a lot of knowledge about gender issues. And I would like to challenge all of us to use this knowledge and um, to, to look at this opportunity now that the UN is establishing a new gender equality entity. I have read for, for some years um, many documents produced on that and I have seen absolutely no reference to any requirement according to UN policy to have 50% men and 50% women work in that entity. Um, just like when the UN merged the, their security uh, services of all the agency, then I, um, on that note also I asked for half men and half women to serve because you have an opportunity. But it turned out that most of the men who were working in the different security departments were expecting not only to stay on but also to get a promotion. So for a woman like me who's working the, the gender route internationally, I might be looking for a wonderful promotion if I wanted to try to apply for that new gender equality entity. But I also know that men and women are in this together. 
and also the UN recruits from the world. So uh, nobody can tell us that they are not qualified men, all, especially from developing countries, um, who would be able to, to, uh, to get posts there. So I think this is really, really important um, at this point. Also, um, I've, since nobody asked me to study this in detail, I took on myself the, a couple of years ago to study how much UN special representatives um, report on women's role in peace building uh, in their work. And you know that they have to file uh, regular reports to the Security Council. And you are also familiar with uh, Resolution 1325 on women, peace, um, uh, women, peace and conflict. And, um, and that they are actually obliged to report. But, you know, it's not really enforced. And so I did an internet search and I, I matched the name of each special representative with 1325. And then I, I checked the first 10 hits. And I found that in 96% of the hits, that person, the special representative or the deputy, had not actually mentioned 1325 himself or herself. There are actually six women among the, the 66 representatives. And I'm sorry to go on here. But uh, I did a very cheeky study, and it has been published in an article that I wrote for the um, uh, Refugee Survey Quarterly. And it is just dreadful results. Because there is an assumption that everybody is able to speak about gender. Uh, but as, uh, as Maria said, it's not really a requirement when, when people are hired at top levels and how they address this. So I just want to challenge all of us and would love to hear your views on how we can now at this crucial moment um, make a campaign so that men will have their rightful place in that new entity. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to take two more questions and then have the uh, panelists respond. I think the second one was right here and the third one here. And then I have... We might need to take a line, just a cue, so I can keep it all straight. All right, please, if you'd stand and introduce yourself, because it is on webcam, and it will help. Samira Qureshi. I work as an independent gender consultant. Thank you to all the speakers um, for some very thought-provoking uh, ideas and information that you've shared. Two quick questions. My first question is for Maria. Um, and I guess it continues from the previous uh, question. I guess what we're talking about is Um, we've been looking at, uh, at gender at a, at a point in time when we went from sort of wit to gad and all of that, and so the focus was still on leveling the playing field and bringing up the side that was sort of mm. way down. Mm -hmm. We now, and, and I guess the key to what you said was the relational aspect. And you mentioned that in the World Bank, the focus is on economic empowerment. Working on issues of economic empowerment, I find that using that argument, the relational argument, is a very strong one. Because even when we talk of economic issues, unless you have all of those factors, the feminine, masculine, the female, male factors in place, you have the care economy, which is predominantly women, this not counted, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the invisibility of women, if we can bring in the male issues in terms of, again, leveling the playing field, from a relational context, I just wondered whether that can be kind of recognizing how economic empowerment will always be a very strong focus no matter what. And, and my second question um, is for any of the speakers. When um, you talked about rape as a weapon of war in times of conflict, I just wondered if you have any data information or any kind of um, research done to see whether there is any difference from a psychological perspective of using rape as a weapon, whether in times of war or in times of peace, and whether how that differs in terms of the psychological background of the perpetrator. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, if you could pass it forward. Thank you. Do have to stand, stand up? Please, yes, if it would be helpful for the audience. My name is Ruth Desir. Um, I've written on issues of women in weapon systems. And I'm particularly interested in one of Maria's comments about what would it look like if heads of states addressed male gender issues. Um, what are you identifying as male gender issues? And what would th that look like for you? What are the issues that you want to see identified that are currently not identified? 
Thank you. Why don't we uh, give the panel uh, a chance to uh, answer these questions, and then I will look for the next three. One, two, three. If you could, Lou, there. Okay. Go ahead. Um, let me see. Um, yes, first, um, I guess Sabia's uh, question on um, women's economic empowerment, and wasn't it a strong argument uh, to bring in the relational side of things? Um, I, I do agree that it is a strong argument. I think that we have a particular situation at the World Bank right now um, which makes it very, very closed um, to, uh, to outside constituencies. Ever since um, President Wolfenson left, uh, there hasn't been much discussion uh, on, on gender issues in the way that we had during his, his tenure at, at, at the bank. And this is also reflected in the way some, of the, uh, some issues such as gender are being dealt with. So we have at the moment quite a, a closed um, group of people working on gender issues. So even though th this is a strong argument, it's just not being brought up. And it's not being brought up internally. It's not being brought up externally. So I do agree with you that it is important. And this is the argument that we make um, in, in the book. But, uh, but alas, this is the situation that the, the bank is in at, at the moment. Um, in terms of, of what are the male gender issues, um, well, we raise a number of them in the book, and of course, uh, Pia and um, and uh, and Mark uh, talked uh, about um, uh, sp specifically um, sexual violence and men's roles in that, and how men are also affected by um, by violent conflict. Um, and um, uh, Mark talks about uh, about youth and young men and how they are also disempowered because of the gender roles and the, the roles that they are expected to play in society. Uh, but there are other issues as, uh, as well. I mean, in 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 a number of, of in many countries actually already in, in the world, including in Latin America, but also in some countries in Africa, you do see disparities in, in education now influencing. Uh, to, to men's disadvantage rather than, or to boys' disadvantage rather than to girls. Uh, there is also how men are affected by HIV AIDS. Uh, so it, it goes, uh, it's, it's health, it's education, it's conflict, it's a range of issues. Now, as I said, I don't expect uh, these issues to be raised by, <laughs> by male leaders, but, um, but they certainly do exist. And they are important. They can be very important. Uh, if you trace, for example, the, the roots of, of conflict, uh, in countries such as Liberia and Sierra Leone, and, and Mark makes the argument in Rwanda, it goes back to men's uh, severe sense of disempowerment because of the expectations that society places on them. I'm not saying that that's the only reason that conflict erupted in these countries, but it is a factor and it's an important one. Any other panelists? Go ahead. Um, sure, I'm going to start with the question of uh, rape as a weapon of war that you asked. Um, we, we start to look into these issues. So I think it, you might also want to uh, look, for example, at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, who really are looking already for a longer time at, this is in the context of DRC, uh, what is kind of the psychological thinking of perpetrators in this context. But uh, just kind of in general, your, your question, the difference you know, in war of in peace, I think in general in peace we see a lot of sexual and gender-based violence as I briefly mentioned earlier in the context of domestic violence. So your starting point is often very, very different. While the sexual and gender-based violence that, that we focus on today, it is usually in the vast majority of cases outsiders who then rape women but who are not directly personally linked and then issues of peer pressure often the especially irregular forces, they are actually forced to, to rape women. Mm -hmm. So you know, your starting point also from a psychological point of view is very different when we look at a situation in war of pe and peace. For example, some data from Eastern DRC, on average, a woman who is raped is raped by four to five men at the same time. To give you kind of an idea of the very different starting point um, I just briefly would like um, 
maybe not respond, but uh, to give a brief comment uh, on, on, on Tina, and this is not a World Bank perspective, but my personal perspective. I definitely believe that positive discrimination, you know, when you say, for example, 50 percent, in some cases is very useful. However, I also think that sometimes this is pushed too far and actually can be a disadvantage for a woman. Um, that sometimes then people might start thinking you have a promotion or a certain job because you were a woman and not because you're the best qualified candidate. Um, <laughs> in our institution at the time being, if you're male and you're white, it's extremely hard to get promoted, even if you're the best qualified candidate. And again, this is my personal opinion. So I think it can be very good, but if we push it too far, I actually think it can be a disadvantage of professional women. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, just with the, the two issues about um, asking for uh, the, uh, the mention of a paradigm shift and this sort of um, um, trying to uh, move these gender issues forward, it seems to me that I don't, I, I wonder if we can get there without understanding two things. Number one, um, that in most societies, masculinity is far more fragile uh, than femininity. In terms of, it, uh, um, the, a man without a job is threatened as a man uh, uh, quite often. And um, so this issue of showing that you're a man uh, is, is a common trait in these sorts of situations. Uh, I remember hearing from, um, a woman's leader in Mozambique that she had to start creating um, income generation programs uh, for men in the communities where she was working because in doing in working in very poor uh, communities where most men where unemployment is very high for men and women um, that uh, you know women <laughs> for the income generating they were doing chickens and selling eggs and chickens uh, in these different places and they get they pay get paid on the last Friday of the month uh, for their projects. And she said every Monday, uh, women would come back with, um, with bruises. Some of them were in the hospital every single Monday afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so as a way to address that, she started creating um, income generation programming for men as well. They had to be separate. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but she did that as a way to help empower women. Mm -hmm. And that really made a, a quite a big influence on me, uh, that this was something that she learned. Um, I think this issue of hegemonic masculinity, is, which is in um, the conclusion of that, that Maria Nian Bannon wrote in the, um, the other half of gender, um, is extraordinarily important because what it really points out, as opposed to seeing men as the enemy, uh, as, she, as, as is common, which Maria mentioned, it really highlights the point that it's a small number of very powerful men who dominate society and, are, uh, and, and that a lot of men and women are involved in humiliating um, poor men. And uh, the, you know, the problem is not that they're being humiliated. I mean, I think this issue of, of one of the most important issues is not just economic issues for men or housing or land. Um, it's also this issue that, that violence as a response to feeling emasculated is a thoroughly unacceptable. Um, yet, uh, in order to get there, you have to recognize that these people are emasculated. So um, I think those two ideas are quite important. I want to just mention briefly about this issue of trauma during wars and after wars. There's a book called uh, Minefields in Their Hearts um, by Roberta. It's edited by uh, Bennett Simon and Roberta Apfel. Um, the introduction is extraordinarily good, and it, and, uh, it highlights this particular issue. And what it says is that when you have, just to simplify, when you have a, 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 a situation, let's say a woman who's raped, when she grows up in a situation that anticipates, expects order, stability, peace, then when she's raped, she's really thrown. And the, and the trauma can be quite severe. And it, as we know, it can last an entire life. Um, in a war zone, uh, they're talking about children, but I think you can, uh, rash, you know, you can assume this more broadly in societies. Um, there is no expectation that life is fair, stable, peaceful, uh, and so forth. And so when rape happens, trauma quite often is not as um, powerful, according to the, the authors. Um, and uh, it's, it's not to excuse it in any way, but it does say that the extent of trauma um, because of this orientation can be less. 
Thank you. I have the woman in purple, excuse me, your second, third, and the gentleman in the back, fourth, and then I'll take the next round, your next time. Thank you. Could you please stand up? Sure. Thank you. I'm Elaine Zuckerman of Gender Action, formerly worked in the World Bank and in the IDB, um, and formerly served on a gender and conflict working group here at USIP. Um, I have two questions. One is addressed to Maria, and it's regarding your mention of a new or revisit of the uh, gender and development policy. I'm dying to know what the new contours might be of it, whether it will explicitly address male and women, men and women, and masculinity and femininity roles. Um, you know, any hints you can give us about it would be welcome. And um, also, I'd like to point out that since the current World Bank gender development policy uh, has been in effect, I have been on a continuous advocacy campaign to get a very pernicious footnote in it removed, which says that this policy does not apply to policy-based loans because about 50% of the bank loans last year were policy-based or sector-wide, you know, which also falls under policy-based. So I was wondering if that hasn't been a topic of discussion of the new gender policy, if you could get it onto the agenda and maybe achieve that so that all bank investments, in fact, <laughs> address gender issues, not just those that are not policy-based loans. So, and also I'd like to point out that both um, the African Development Bank and the forthcoming IDB gender policy do cover policy-based loans. That is, they're part of the um, gender arena. So those are models for you. Um, secondly, I have a question that belongs to my colleague Diana Arango, who could not attend, who used to work at UNHCR, I think with Tina, um, and also she worked for other UN agencies, UNFPA and UNIFAM. Her question is that she feels these UN agencies, UNHCR, UNFPA, UNIFAM, for example, um, have made tremendous strides in working with men to address gender-based violence in particular. Um, and she wonders whether uh, the World Bank formally collaborates with these UN agencies on gender-based violence um, in conflict. Thanks. Thank you, Elaine. The next oh, question. And, and that was for both Maria and Pia. All right. Thank you, Elaine. Right behind you, Ryan, the w woman in the aisle. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Sarah Scotch, and I work with En Avant Congo. We started in 2003 to try to get aid to, um, to, to survivors of mass rape in Sud Kivu, in eastern Congo. So my question is for Mark Summers. I was really interested to hear about your findings in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. um, and what came to mind for me was that, you know, you want to work with people where you are, where they are, <laughs> rather, and listen to them. But instead of focusing maybe on helping um, male youth build houses, what I was hearing was that they're, ex they're all involved in a, um, what's essentially a very destructive construction of of masculinity, femininity, and adulthood. Mm -hmm. And maybe it would be helpful in a place with, like Rwanda with such a, a developed civil society to try an alternative approach, like a national youth initiative, of reflection groups for young, you know, for female youth, for male youth, to start looking at what their constructions of adulthood and, and, and gender are, and whether they're helpful. Um, and in the room we have, uh, Joe Vest from Men Can Stop Rape, which is uh, a group here that does something similar to that here in the United States. We have Gary Barker over here who has, whose organization has had groups in Brazil, South Africa, and India. Correct me if you have others. But these, these programs and models of this kind of programming and reflection do exist, and they have been proven to be very effective. So I'd love to hear what you have to say. Who do I hand it to? Great. Thank you very much. I'm aware that we are really are, uh, have so many very knowledgeable people in this room and that this is just the tip of the iceberg and I will promise to follow up with more seminars so that we can hear from all of you. There's a great deal of uh, exchange that still needs to happen. I'm Nadine Mildice, I'm a school teacher. And what I'm hearing, it was a very interesting panel, 
what I'm hearing, a, a specific uh, item, was putting men first, which is um, something that's code for getting money flowing. Um, and what I'd like the panel to address is how will you keep the monetary resources flowing equitably? And I don't mean to be lighthearted about this at all, but we'll build each guy a house and then the ladies will get to duke it out with them. Um, you know, for economic stability. But I'm most interested in hearing how you would keep those resources equitable. Thank, Thank you. you. And finally, so no. uh, Good afternoon. Um, my name is Sana Mandarlini. I am not from the Cesarean Awareness Network, which says on the list, um, I've had a Cesarean, but I don't know anything about Cesareans. Um, <laughs> sorry, just, just to clarify. Um, <laughs> Um, I work with I UNDP on. <laughs> I just I, I just noticed it. Um, I, I work with UNDP um, currently on a project looking at uh, what's going on with men in crisis settings, not necessarily hot conflict, but post conflict and other fragile settings. And what I'm and, and my previous work, as as many of you know, is is looking at the role of women as in peace building. Um, again, not looking necessarily as women in terms of having from a rights based approach, but looking at it in terms of we need to do better peace building. Women. Um, are stakeholders and potential agents of change, so we should recognize that role. And I think of the question of men in the same way, that we should be looking at men in terms of the context of crisis and understanding how do we s resolve this problem. And I'm coming up with two sort of big picture issues. One is that um, one of the challenges that we have is that we're dealing with development agencies and people who are development practitioners who don't know crisis very well and feel uncomfortable dealing with crisis, conflict, political change and transition, which is feeding into the development setting, and so step back from dealing with these issues. The second is that so much of what we're seeing in terms of places that are uh, affected by crisis are, are resulting from the structural adjustment policies of our friends at the IMF, and I don't know whether the World Bank was involved in it as well, but, but 30 years of structural adjustment and, and lack of social welfare has created a vacuum um, in which a lot of this crisis and conflict is thriving. And it's not just the churches that are active, it's actually gangs and all the other bad guys that are drawing the guy, th these young men in using gender identity issues and masculinity issues. So, th so the question for me is how are you, in, in, this, in this discussion of gender where we see gender as a nice little project that we have, how are, how are these bigger issues being dealt with? Because it, it really goes to the heart of development practice and the recognition that we're, we're dealing with crisis or fragi fragility in most of the places that we're working with now. Uh, I'm going to actually take uh, two more questions for the sake of time because I know that there are so many interesting comments here that also want to be made. I think you are next and the gentleman far in the back. Go ahead. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. My question is... Could you uh, identify yourself? Yeah, sorry. My name is Nimad Ahmadi. Uh, I'm working with Save Darfur Coalition. And formerly, I did work with Oxfam Great Britain and Intermediate Technology Development Group, which is practical action now, uh, mainly in capacity building and women uh, empowerment. Um, my question is um, related to the way we are or there's so many other people that are working in this area communicating the, 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 the issues, like the language that is used. Is there any way that we can use it so that we'll make men, both men and women take more responsibility in address, addressing gender issues? Like always when people talk about gender, as many people mention that this goes to people's mind that it's women issues. But in many different cases, it's not only, it's the community issues. For me, it is, um, it is our community issues. What affecting women is affecting both men and women and youth as well. And in a conflict situation, the other question is, the, in, during the conflict situation as um, currently in Darfur, for example, changing in roles, um, women were expected to be protected by ma the male member of their families or the, their communities, but that is not the case currently when the rape is being used as a weapon of war and most of women that are de devastated. And then um, pe when addressing the issues, people are not thinking of both men and women that are victimized. Men feel that they were unable and they are helpless, not to, they, they weren't able to, to protect the, their families. 
in terms of doing trauma counseling intervention, people targeting women, but uh, <coughs> not targeting. Is there any, any ways of, um, of bringing both men and women? I know that mm -hmm. if we are also advocating for bringing men, in some cases may not be uh, helpful because of the already unequal opportunities that are, are exist, but at least ways of strengthening the weaknesses that are exist for both men and women so that we can address. And then uh, the other um, issue is with the attitude change, like working on the area of attitude change for both men and women so that people can be able to address these issues. Thank you. Yeah. And one last question in the back, and then I'm going to allow the panel to s combine their answers and also their summary comments. Yes. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, my name is Jesse Bernstein, and I'm a refugee advocate with Human Rights First. I formerly worked with UNHCR in the Balkans, as well as uh, with different humanitarian and human rights organizations in Central and East Africa. And um, I wanted to talk about homosexuality. I have to say, frankly, I was surprised that none of the panelists in their initial remarks raised the issue of homosexuality, not just as an issue, but as a primary obstacle to addressing men and women who endure SGBV. Um, I know from my work in Uganda that when men, uh, w when Congolese refugee men approach the police uh, after being raped, one of their responses from, from the police was, uh, men can't be raped, and if uh, a male has been raped, it's because he wanted it, assuming that he is gay. Uh, so obviously that has massive implications um, and prevents people from, from responding and from trying to address their crimes. Um, as we know, the issue isn't, isn't limited, unfortunately, to Uganda. 80 countries in the world criminalize same-sex practice, and even those countries that don't, there, there's pervasive homophobia. Um, so i just like to highlight this, and one resource which is really helpful is a documentary called Gender Against Men, produced by the Refugee Law Project, and it really, really highlights this problem. Um, it's, it's quite controversial, uh, but it, it goes some way in, in highlighting the challenges of men who've experienced SGBV in Central Africa. Thank you very much. I'm going to now ask the uh, panelists to keep your remarks to the point. Um, and we will, you have each about two minutes to try. Two, two, two minutes. Well, I, I, it's an impossible task, I know. And as I said, I will make sure that we have a follow-up session because we haven't heard from even half of the people who raised their hands. And we need to have more discussions on this. So um, maybe in the order in which you first presented, Pia, then Mark, um, and then Maria. Sure, I was already getting used to being able to think about my responses while Maria was talking. <laughs> no, we're all ready to go. <laughs> so I'm just going to answer a few of them uh, in the benefit of time. Are we uh, working together with the UN agencies? I think the question came from uh, over there. Uh, first, I want to mention this issue for the World Bank, um, and now I'm talking especially on, on sexual and gender-based violence, is very new for us too. We barely started working on this about a year ago, and um, yes, we have outreach from the beginning to our UN colleagues, although I think we could do a better job on that um, if we would have more time, but that is definitely in the planning for the coming years to keep a close collaboration with our colleagues from the UN. Um, the question of putting men first, does that mean the resources, you, you know, basically uh, the competition of resources? I would like to turn this around. I don't think it is a competition of resources. I don't think, or I don't think we should think about it, it's either one or the other, but that it's really in the mutual benefit of both men and women when you work on gender that you work on male gender issues and on um, female gender issues. And I also don't believe that we need separate programs. It's not, we will have a program for women and separately we have a program for men. I believe some of the best programming is where you do address gender issues of men and women inside of the, of the same program that you uh, can get the furthest. Um, on the question from, from Sanam, how are you do dealing with the bigger issues? Um, I think maybe uh, I'm not going to try to even respond to the IMF structural adjustment over the last 30 years and the impact that has currently in the developing world. We might leave that for a different debate. I absolutely agree with you that many 
the problem to work on these issues is that many people don't understand uh, working in conflict context and what that actually means and the impact of that. Um, currently, how this is being dealt with in the World Bank, we, rec we have recognized this as, as an institution over the last couple of years, and conflict and post-conflict is one of the six key strategic areas from our current president. So do we need to learn much more also inside of our institution and with the agencies we work with? Absolutely but I think we are on a better track there than before. And then just uh, Nima absolutely agree that we should work um, uh, on, on the language and the suggestions that you made were, were extremely relevant. And I could also um, second the last comment that was made on the video Gender Against Man from uh, the Refugee Law Project from, among others, Chris. Uh, it's an extremely interesting movie. Yes, it is controversial, but it's definitely worth watching. I just uh, wanted to say one more, if I may, uh, issue. We organized on the male side of gender-based violence in sub-Saharan Africa in conflict slash post-conflict context, a workshop last year in June, which was um, a collaborated effort of the World Bank ICRW and Men Engage, uh, together with Gary Barker, um, who is one of the co-authors of a report of that workshop, which um, we, we probably will bring out in the coming months. So uh, that might be a good source of information for people who want to learn more about this, both on the research, research as well as operational questions. Thank you. I'm just going to cherry pick three uh, questions given my time limitation. The first is on uh, that Sarah mentioned about, uh, uh, about Rwanda and uh, getting involved in the construction of masculinity in adulthood. Um, that strikes me as social engineering. I'm uncomfortable with it. The Rwandan government has demonstrated many times that it is not. Um, the, with regarding working through um, civil society, there's a comment that it's well developed. We actually did a study or some research into um, uh, youth um, groups in Rwanda and found that it's almost entirely a facade, that these are unemployed male youth um, <laughs> um, that are very well intentioned. Um, their reach and their ability to work uh, across the class line, the class divide, which is mammoth in Rwanda, is, is, uh, doesn't seem to be working well at all. And it's not uh, for not of trying for most of them. It's just very hard to do. What that means, uh, this idea of a reflection group, um, my sense is, uh, thinking is that it's going to feature uh, elite, educated uh, Rwandan youth. And because they are so suspect, their credibility is so narrow and suspect, with the marginalized youth majority, I, didn't, I don't think it'll work. What I think might work and what seems to be working very well are soap operas on the radio about these issues. Boy, do they make an impact on, on youth all over the country. That's a, that, that way works as opposed to doing sort of re, uh, 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 you know, relying on this extraordinary degree of, um, of um, social hierarchy that, take, that uh, exists in a place like Rwanda. Um, uh, the second issue about structural adjustment, I just wanted to mention, Sanam, that um, there was a study that connected uh, the imposition or the beginning of structural adjustment policies, which means that you, the, the removal of subsidies for food, uh, cutting back a lot of government uh, jobs, and the study was in northern Nigeria. And um, what this, this research found is that structural adjustment in, uh, policies validated youth violence. Because if you're going to lose your job and now food's really expensive, then you don't have a choice. So go right ahead. It's OK to, be, uh, to join these gangs and, uh, and take it. And what they found was that these traditional youth associations many often became, uh, many times became criminal. A minute. Uh, <laughs> Uh, just to clarify, um, Elaine, there is uh, not an ongoing revision of the gender policy. It's in the, uh, the independent evaluation group of the World Bank is reviewing the policy and the application of the policy. So just to be clear on that. Um, in terms of the, the question about the equitable resources, I just wanted to emphasize what Pia is saying. It is not a question of taking resources away from, from women and giving them to men. I think that if we... I, the experience has shown uh, in, 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 in our 
um, in the bank that when you start to talk about male gender issues, you can bring other constituents in that you otherwise would not bring. So it actually allows you to talk about gender issues in, in new contexts, and it actually can increase the, the, the kinds of resources um, uh, that are going to, to gender issues. And in looking at male gender issues, then female gender issues come up as well. So, so I, I um, just wanted to emphasize that point. Uh, Pia already referred to the structural adjustment policies question. This is a big, big question, and I think one that, that would be um, beyond what we can take on at this point, even though I agree. I think it is coming up, for example, though, in discussions about unemployed uh, youth, for example, and, and what has led to, to the circumstances in which um, youth uh, find themselves in, in that situation. Um, I just wanted to end about on this question about how to make uh, gender more inclusive, um, the question of the language. Uh, I, I believe that I indirectly, in a way, if, if we talk about gender still, there's, there's gender has been so tainted, the word has almost been so tainted that gender is almost always um, equated with women. Uh, but when, when we worked on, on uh, gender issues in, in agriculture and rural development, we were, t we were able to talk about the circumstances, the roles that men and women were playing, the circumstances that, that rural families were in, and we would then be able to bring in both men and women in a, in a more neutral place. It, it was less loaded. Um, similarly, when it, I mentioned again the, 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 the issue of uh, unemployed youth, we can talk about gender issues in that context. We're not talking about women's equality when talking about gender equality. We're talking about issues that are of real concern. So it's more indirect, but I think it can have um, more impact, and I think that it can lead to ultimately um, at the, the attitudinal changes that, that uh, we're looking for. Uh, I just wanted to, to mention one other thing I had noted in my in my presentation that we didn't expect um, male leaders to be talking about man, masculinity, et cetera. But it is interesting that they are bringing up the, the issues that affect men. So, so, that's, uh, so that's, that, that, that is very positive. And I, I don't want to go on about the, 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 the youth issues, but it is one that is coming up over and over again because it is a concern. And in doing so, we can open the door to uh, looking at uh, the gender issues that um, that uh, lead to the unemployed youth, male youth. Okay, I'll just end there, thanks. Thank you very much. Obviously, uh, this has been a rich session with many more questions. Uh, <laughs> I wish uh, that you would join me in thanking our panelists today. <laughs> they clearly, um, they had their work cut out for them, and um, I did ask if they could stay a little longer, and uh, if you have questions or more comments, that we can move this to an uh, informal kind of session. Thank you very much for coming. We'll see you next time. <laughs>